as they um, as they're ready. So my name is Dr. Amanda Chisholm, and I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Security Studies. And I lecture on um, gender and security. Uh, I'm also the organizer and the chair of this New Voices in Global Security seminar series. This is the second year it's been running, and it's designed to showcase the vibrant and brilliant research of our PhD and early career researchers across the school, um, and uh, give, it give us a chance to engage in um, the, the different research research that um, is taking place. So today we have um, Dr. Andrea Espinoza up, uh, who is going to be talking on um, a presentation titled Productive Violence, Identifying Narratives Used to Legitimize Abuse. So um, Dr. Espinoza is a lecturer in the International Relations and Gender Education here in the Department of War Studies. She's also a feminist researcher who focuses on women's and indigenous rights in Latin America, particularly in uh, Ecuador and the Andean region. Her work aims to understand how women interact with law, institutions, and development projects. And her work considers women's active involvement in the interpretation, confrontation, and adaptation to normative frameworks. In that sense, she is interested in how women react, adapt, and or normalize behaviors to survive, endure, or disrupt hierarchies and subordinate of power structures. She, her research follows a feminist and decolonial epistemology uh, and relies on ethnographic and arts-based research methods. So Dr. Espinoza has a MSc in Latin American development and a PhD in gender and development here at King's College London. And before working as an academic, she was a journalist in Ecuador. So um, uh, Andrea here is joined uh, today by Professor Yelka Bolston, who will act as her discussant. Um, professor Bolston is a professor in gender and development here at KCL. Her current research focuses on the transformative gender justice in post-conflict societies, the idea that intervention, uh, interventions to address gender injustice, such as violence against women and girls, should aim to transform the social, political, and economic relations that underpin the possibility of violence. And recently, Yelka finished a collaborative project exploring the transformative um, potential of memorial art and symbolic reparation. I want to welcome you both, a warm welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Um, so Andrea has, uh, has agreed to talk for about uh, 20 ish minutes um, and share some slides for then uh, we'll hand over to Yelka for discussant and then open to you the audience for any sort of questions or comments. You can either raise your Zoom hand to ask the question live or just type your question in the question answer and I will um, ask it um, uh, to Andrea after that. Um, I think that's all clear. Everyone's good to go. Great, Sandra, without further ado, I'm going to pass the virtual floor over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amanda, for everything, including inviting me and making the summary of, of my research, which is always weird to hear. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my uh, PowerPoint. Um, hopefully you can see my PowerPoint now. Um, I, what you're going to see are mostly images. Um, I apologize because most of them, or a lot of them, have a lot of Spanish uh, there, but I think it really goes with the presentation, so hopefully that's not a problem. So, um, years ago, when I started my research about violence against women and legal systems, one of my colleagues asked me, why do men hit women? I answer, because they can. That answer holds. As I will explain today, some social norms condone certain type of uh, gender-based violence. However, during this presentation, I aim to add that violence against women is also productive violence, as it facilitates the functioning of a patriarchal and capitalist society. Now, how productive could it be to perform an act that could easily be judged as a crime and that could that with consequences scar victims in a way that affects their psychological and physical well-being. How productive could it be in a way to do something that can damage networks and disrupt societies? Since the early 2000s, international organizations have been working on um, 
establishing that the socioeconomical cost of violence against women and girls. In Ecuador, the South American country I'm focusing for this analysis, a 2013 study explained that small business owned women suffer because of things as violence. Um, the document mentions how violence impacts the amount of time that women can give to their enterprises and reduce the amount of money that, that they can invest in them. Um, it states that one woman can lose around 54 days dealing with the consequences of violence and her business can lose more than a thousand more, more than two thousand dollars because of the violence um, this is without considering the amount of money the ecuadorian state have to invest in topics like the present like the prosecution and prevention of violence so that's around four thousand million dollars per year these very quantified quantifiable consequences of violence against women have been also analyzed in India, Uganda, Vietnam, as well as the EU, Canada, the United States, and the UK. These findings related to so the socioeconomical cause of violence against women and girls can only be added to the violence of the violation of women's rights that are penalized offenses nation in national and international law. So then, if violence against women so clearly generates losses to the state and the individual, how could it be called productive? What is productive about violence and why am I deciding to call it this way? When I refer to productive violence, I aim to disclose, to make visible, the amount of the level of entrenchment that violence has in everyday life. When discussing productive violence, we are discussing gender-based violence and violence against women and girls, not as something exceptional, but as a practice with a purpose to subdue and control women, girls, and feminized bodies. While studies effectively argue about the amount of money and opportunity lost to violence, they render invisible that with high levels, levels of violence, one in every three women experience some type, the world keeps going around. In Ecuador, six in every 10 women have experienced some type of violence during their lives. And, this, and the state keeps being a functional state. Um, moreover, it is categorized as an upper middle income country with potential of growth and prosperity, according to the World Bank. Um, in this sense, the subordination of women and girls implemented using violence in its many forms allows society to function as it had always has by establishing patriarchal structures set to extract free labor and create and enforce structures of obedience. The previously depiction of violence as a loss of money and opportunity are structured around the idea of future gains and future opportunities available to the state and individual lost because of violence. However, those changes in patterns and behaviors are meant so any change to those patterns and behaviors are um, meant to be an improvement in an already working system. The patriarchal society and state, its systems of production and organization function in a way that are already effective, self-reproducing and self-defending. The use of the concept of productive violence allows us to explore who is benefiting from violence against women, girls, and feminized bodies, and have a better understanding of why it's so widespread and normalized. Gago, Veronica Gago, an Argentinian scholar, explained that one of the main advantages to account for the specific economy of violence against women, lesbians, transvestites, and trans people is that we can move beyond the interpretation of violence as a crime or as isolated pathologies or deviant behavior. After all, as it is written in many graffitis in Latin America and the world, he, meaning the perpetrator of violence, is not sick. He's a healthy son of patriarchy. Violence uh, against women, girls, and feminized bodies allows an effective function of a society that extracts free labor from women, enforces norms about sex and sexuality, and perpetrates hierarchies that will enable the government go governance of certain bodies. In that sense, we can understand productive violence as a facilitator to a desirable purpose. Violence becomes expected, accepted, and even desired. 
in the case of gender-based violence and violence against women and girls used to provide punishment or irregular for irregular behavior, teach a lesson to unruly bodies, create or restore social hierarchies, and reproduce social norms within a group. There is normality and acceptance in the, in the infliction and experience of violence in those cases, be it physical or psychological. It creates and maintains an order within a group. To illustrate, I will use three examples. When I was growing up, uh, so this is violence against women and girls and the idea of uh, destruction of uh, free labor. When I was growing up, there was a common joke among adults. What is the best way to give women a little more freedom? The answer was expanding the kitchen. The joke reinforced women's role within uh, reference, the women's role within the household and their experience um, and and how they exist within the, home, within the home boundaries. The kitchen was that place intimate tied to women's competence. The kitchen is a space tied to women's unpaid and undervalued uh, reproductive and productive roles. As explained by Federici, the power difference between women and men and the concealing of women's unpaid labor under the cover of natural inferiority have enabled capitalism to expand and to foster male workers' patterns of devaluating and disciplining women and children to maintain their power and respect to capital. Women cook, women clean, women serve. Women work in the household uh, is one of their unpaid responsibilities and womanly duties, even when they have work outside the home. Violence plays a role, an important role in maintaining those dynamics. It is not just that violence, it is not just the violence of a blow, a kick, a smack, meaning physical violence, but the symbolic violence experienced in the shame of not fulfilling a duty or failing in an expected role. In Ecuador, according to a national statistics published in 2019, 44.9, so 45% of Ecuadorian women older than 15 years uh, believe that women are responsible for the household's chores. This percentage is higher in indigenous women and women that have not completed primary education. Furthermore, in a national survey published in 2011, so that's what you're looking at uh, now, 7% of married women consider that not obeying their partner or husband will be a viable reason for a man to hit his partner. In addition, 11% believe that not taking good care of the children is another possible reason that can justify a man hitting a woman. One example of the role of violence in regulating personal relations appears in my research. I research indigenous women experience in reporting violence within um, their indigenous communities and in the state justice system in Ecuador. One common question asked within the community in cases of intimate partner violence was, have you been good, meaning a good wife, or have you been neglect neglecting your household, your husband, or your children? The question appears before, during, and after any formal procedure to investigate, judge, or punish violence. The question presents two clear ideas. Violence is something that, that can happen as a punishment for bad behavior, and good behavior could contribute to avoid violence. In this scenario, violence is not the problem. The issue is the unfulfillment of gender expectations. If violence is always a looming possibility, the primary tool to avoid it is to act in ways that comply with social expectations. In that case, when violence is not provoked, um, an act of violence would be considered abusive or detrimental to the community. So my second point is violence enforce norms of sex and sexuality. Following the pattern I established in the previous section, I will um, reference another popular phrase in Ecuador. Amarre a su vaca que mi toro anda suelto. In a literal translation, the expression will sound like tie up your cow or put your cow in a safe place as my bull is running free. In that sense, um, 
anything that could happen to the cow, meaning a woman, um, is her fault uh, or their fault of the family because they didn't take the precautions to make them safe. As explained by Rita Segato, for many, instead of a crime, rape constitutes a punishment. And the rapist, instead of a criminal, often perceive himself as a moralizer or an avenger of morality. In that sense, sexual violence is socialized, not necessarily as a crime, but as a teachable moment about the wrongful behavior that would be conducive to the punishment of sexual violence. Also, from that perspective, a victim of sexual violence is not just a body being punished, by a theatrical prop used to inform, enforce the value of purity and decency. According to Ecuadorian national statistics, 57.3% of women think that women must behave and dress modestly not to provoke men. The statistics are quite high in different ethnic groups and different levels of education. National statistics also state that 15% of Ecuadorian women believe that women must have intercourse with their husbands and partners when their partners want. Sexual violence is not that a theme that appears directly in my research, not because it was not present in the community I visited, but because there was little reference to it. Although one of the few examples was the case of a rape of a young girl by two brothers. The man who told me this story made sure to mention um, the girl's parents allow her to stay for long times in the pastures. And she used to hang around the, the boys too much in a way that could be misinterpreted as romantic interest. Again, sexual violence was explained as triggered by a girl's bad behavior. Additionally, the bad behavior did not only point to the victim, but also to the victim's keepers or protectors meaning the family. They also failed to pro in protecting their women. The victim of sexual violence and her story are a cautionary tale about the importance of family need to protect women and women need to be modest and cautious to avoid, avoid violence. Similar to the previous sections, violence fulfills a purpose. Violence offers a teachable moment. Uh, my final example talks about the government governance about, over some bodies. Um, my final example of violence as a medium to obtain desirable outcomes is much more explicit as it involves an actual monetary transaction. In Ecuador, since 2013, the state has discovered 268 centros de deshomosexualización. Um, that is centers to cure homosexuality. These organizations, some were acting with the permission of local authorities, use rape, physical attacks, and verbal abuse among their methods. In 2016, the disappearance of a 15-year-old boy made visible the regular operation of these organizations. The adolescent was institutionalized by his mother because he was having bad behaviors in reference to his sexuality. The adolescent mother paid for a clinic that will change for the boy's bad behavior. There were other reported cases. Paola Sirid was institutionalized in one of the centers for two years, and she was raped almost daily. Paola Concha survived 18 months in another center where she was handcuffed to a pipe as part of her treatment. In these particular cases, violence is an explicit part of a transaction. It is part of a service. It contributes to imposing rules over unruling and deviant bodies. In Ecuador, the depenalization, so this is not a criminal activity of homosexuality, was established in 1997 by a sentence of the Constitutional Court. While the law was changed and continued to change in expanding the rights uh, of the members of the LGBTQI community, social norms still condemn homosexuality as a deviant behavior. Gay couples have problems renting property, validating their marital status, and accessing healthcare. As questions, all expressions of structural violence. Understanding the productive terms of violence 
being physical, psychological, structural, or symbolic, allows a working system to be revealed. Violence applied to some bodies under certain circumstances with particular goals works benefiting individuals and institutions that exist to perpetuate that violence. The heteronormative and patriarchal family members uh, need to retain their power. The state institutions need to retain their moral legitimacy. And the, state, and the capitalist and colonial system of production need to extract free labor um, and their value in yeah, free labor. There. These three examples, oops, yes. These three examples aims to explain that a system mediated by violence works and is not exceptional. It is entrenching normality. It established modes of obedience that perpetuate the power dynamics of one group of individuals over another. As I have presented here, these practices of violence might not be perceived and interpreted as crimes, but as practices that teach, guide, restore, and improve. To, to talk about productive violence also allow us to think about a working system that is constantly innovating. As part of a functioning system, the use of violence and what we understand as productive violence is constantly changing. For example, in the 1930s, uh, in Ecuador, a man could kill, harm, or hit his wife if he found her cheating. That is not an option anymore. However, the creation of new technologies has allowed the possibility of punishing unfaithful women in different ways, such as revenge porn. Um, time has time have changed how violence is inflicted by its role in punishing and desirable behavior is still present. To think about productive violence also aims to recognize that if human rights, women's rights, LGBTQI rights, and feminist agendas are pushing forward to demand equality, participation, visibility, and autonomy, the patriarchal system is pushing back. For that perspective, Gago presents a relevant reflection. She explains that contemporary societies are experiencing a destabilization of the modes of government governance in the monogamous and heteronormative family, in part because now women are more prone to express a greater desire for autonomy, and the male provider figure is depreciating. In that light, the evaluating masculinity to find themselves in a desperate and violent search to leg legitimize themselves. But this desperate search for legitimization goes beyond the evaluated masculinities or wounded expressions of the patriarchal state. All the individuals indirectly benefiting from working structures of domination participate in the innovation of a system that legit legitimizes violence. Finally, the concept of productive violence allows us to explore how the um, threshold of socially and legally accepted gender-based violence are established. If I interrogate productive violence, it is also relevant to think about unproductive violence, or what is unproductive violence. I refer to unproductive violence as something that is considered illegitimate, negatively sanctioned, um, and that is considered harmful to the community and a threat to the individual because it provides undesirable outcomes. The threshold of tolerance towards violence against women and particularly intimate partner violence is set by the tension between these two categories. That which is unproductive is not accepted while that which is productive is. As this threshold is socially constructed, it is dynamic and subject to change over time. Going back to the previous examples, unproductive violence is the violence perpetuated to good women, to decent women, to modest and pure women that were not asking for it. Um, thank you. I think I can stop my presentation there. Uh, final, less horrible a slide there. Great, thank you so much. Yelka, are you able to jump in with any sort of reflections? Yes, yes, yes. 
Definitely. Thank you so much, uh, Amanda, for having us both. Thank you, Andrea, for your wonderful presentation. And uh, the images really pulls out the meaning as well. Um, just a couple of comments specifically um, on what you presented today. So I think that the idea of productive violence is, is really useful because of the, your starting question. You know, people ask, well, why do men uh, uh, hit women? No, well, it, it seems so illogical considering that's often about the women they're supposed to be love. No, so what do we do with that contrast? Um, so, sort of, we tend to perceive violence as something that destroys, that is destructive, that it hurts, it harms, it it breaks. It's no, it's something destructive. And your the numbers that you mentioned at the start of your uh, talk also indicates that it is actually it is a, a, it has a, a, a economic harm as well at a at a national level. So it's it's useful to ask, but what does it give those who are beat? And what kind of structures? Why are these structures so uh, persistent? Um, and your answer is well, because it actually produces something. Violence produces something. And then what does it produce? Well, it produces dominance subordination, i.e. it produces a hierarchy between men and women, not only between men and women. Hence, it produces um, sexual boundaries, heteronormativity that is related to the power of heterosexual men. No, it, it's, it's you, you counter uh, anything that is not heteronormative. And very importantly, that this domination, this patriarchal domination creates labor. No, it's free labor in the kitchen, as you so very clearly uh, indicated. So in that sense, violence is indeed, it, produces something. But that then also, yeah, th then again, that question about, about um, the intimacy of these forms of violence that, um, uh, that you refer to, particularly intimate partner violence, domestic violence, family violence, which suggests that this is a disciplining violence, no? It is a, a sort of, it's legitimate because it disciplines people who are uh, who behave outside the normative framework of um, uh, of a community, basically. So this disciplining is not only directed at women who transgress, who don't do, who don't behave according to those normative patriarchal um, frameworks, but very often also to children, and particularly, of course, to children in adolescence, because that's when the, the sexual transgression becomes uh, an issue. Um, so, so there is this, you know, violence as a disciplining um, uh, tool uh, that produces, maintains, perpetuates these hierarchies. No. So I think that this the sort of violence as disciplining. Uh, would sort of make that link between uh, productive violence, what does it produces, and the intimacy of that violence, i.e. it's so very often within the home. No, it's not a state that disciplines or that is violence towards um, um, those perceived as others, uh, or a, a judicial violence or a carceral violence. No, it's it's intimate partners. No, so uh, th th that's that's one point that I wanted to make about um, the productivity yeah. of violence. Now, if we take that point around disciplining a step further, then I think something that came out less from your presentation, but that, that I know, of course, of your research, and it's there in your presentation as well, is that, that you've looked in your, your, your main data of your research looks at indigenous communities, you know? And then this one of the last slides that you showed um, uh, um, uh, recalls the lashes, you know? Uh, Chilcote as a as a the lash as a as a disciplining tool literally. Now that has all kinds of colonial connotations, of course. You no, know? so uh, th there's this question of what kind of tools of discipline. Uh, it, it also goes back to discipline. So the, the 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 lash is being used to discipline men and women who are in an inferior position. This is a colonial practice towards peons, towards um, no uh, slaves and and. 
and and workers, laborers who who are perceived as indigenous in a in a colonial society, or as as a subordinate in a colonial society. And a lot of these practices have a, have a sort of a post colonial uh, reverberation in indigenous communities. So not not only in a national level where the president is waving his his belt in order to make a point about his hard stance towards corruption, but also within indigenous communities, the lash has become this very symbol of, of, of community discipline and even of domestic discipline. No, it's pretty normal in, in, in many communities until very recently, and perhaps even today, that the lash is a completely acceptable way of disciplining children. No? And then uh, even also in certain contexts to discipline women as well. No? And that then brings me to uh, another point that, that is sort of uh, uh, in your presentation slightly um, um, perhaps uh, um, suggested is sort of the, the difference between what might be formal productive violence within frameworks of justice or within frameworks that, that are very clearly uh, sort of carried by a majority of a particular population as legitimate, hence community justice via all kinds of procedures, uh, violence that is perpetrators as part of such processes in schools against children with a lash and so on. And then slightly more informal forms of discipline uh, such as domestic violence, which, which carries this ambiguous um, level of to what extent are certain forms legitimate or illegitimate? And sexual violence is a very uh, clear example of this ambiguity, I think, because uh, th there is this, there's always this question. Um, so it, is it about women, woman's behavior or girl's behavior? Did she, what, was she too liberal in her behavior? What was she wearing? No. Or is it actually, and that is a question, does it all also count who the perpetrator of that violence is? I, is there a difference between a, a, a member of a family who disciplines women and girls, even in a sexual manner, because that's that sort of violence is often also used as a form of disciplining, or if it's someone external to that intimate um, set of relationships, and hence it cannot be seen anymore as a legitimate form of disciplining. This is something that I've been thinking about myself, no, in the, the difference between women talking about the husband who, um, uh, who is violent towards them and, and sometimes very violent, i.e. with really physical harm, and a police officer or a soldier who is violent. And that those forms of violence are interpreted differently because they have different levels of legitimacy. That was my thinking. But then again, if you look at how husbands respond to violence from external or from others, then still often women are being um, uh, seen as culpable. No, you see that in the courts all over, not only in Ecuador or in Peru, but also in the UK. No, and then it's still about what was she wearing. No, so these sort of these these ambiguous um, legitima legitimations of violence, and when it is destruct seen as de unproductive or productive, those are the terms that you're using, is is also interesting to sort of see uh, where the line. Um, lies between these two. And lastly, I guess that sort of related to all this between between the, this question of, on the one hand, the intimacy of violence and the productivity of violence and the legitimacy of disciplining violence is, is then, you know, refers back to an old feminist um, um, claim is that women within the patriarchy, women and children are seen as the property of men. No, and that is something that 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 uh, I I haven't heard really in your in in your research in your uh, presentation, but that might um, uh, merit a little bit more thinking. To what extent, both informally, i.e., on a normative level, and formally, i.e., in law, 
are women and children still seen as the property of men? And, and that perhaps uh, the, the work of Veronica Garo is also interesting in this sense, I think, who you also cited extensively, because she makes that link between um, embodiment, women's bodies, land, and exploitation, no? So, so how, how, you, how men appropriate, uh, or particular uh, uh, sectors appropriate women's bodies and land with a, with a very similar patterns of exploitation and productive violence, no? But productive for whom? I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you for those comments. Those were really great you know, to think about. Um, how shall we proceed? Like, I, I would really like to make comments over the comments because they're they're quite good. Um, yeah, and let's um, let's have a conversation here because there's so far no one's put anything in the question box. So yeah, let's just have a broader conversation here. So please, Andrea, the floor is yours. Oh, perfect. So, um, I I have a problem with with the idea of intimacy as something that happens uh, and this is one of the things that i have been really questioning about this because all the examples look very intimate like because that's also the scope of my research so the, the connection between intimate partner violence within the household or the violence of a parent deciding to discipline their children through these uh, centers for curing homosexuality um, and it all feels intimate feels like disciplining a body and another body in, in, a, in a very um, close context, in the context of the home. But I was thinking about the home as, as the most, um, as the smallest productive unit. So that's the unit that I research, but that unit is part of, an, of a bigger productive system. Like it, it's just the most, the smallest part of a productive system. And one of the things that, and that's really why I didn't want to use particularly the example of indigenous communities, because then it feels even small, even it feels like the family unit within a particular ethnic group. However, this um, is intertwined with different levels of violence or how violence is perceived in different groups in society. Um, so when you were referring to, and I really like the idea of formal and informal productive violence. So what it's formalized through things as law and what it appears a little bit more informal, which is the family. But I won't say just the family, but society as the broader society. Um, because that's also interesting between what is a state in law and what is government rhetoric. So there is also the difference between the state as something that has laws and regulations and constitutions and so on, and the government and the rhetoric generated around those legal implements. And I think that those trigger down to the smallest unit that I'm calling the family. So it, it also goes back to the idea of the intimate is international and then the intimate is public because uh, it's not it's not this it's not contained within the boundaries of the family it talks about the conditions of the of communities and the bigger society and definitely the rhetorics of governments uh, yeah of governments and we can see that in the way government um in Peru or in Ecuador have a very conservative rhetoric that resonates with a particular set of voters if we're thinking about uh, how people vote in relation to these topics. Um, and I think that becomes very, very visible now in the way, because abortion is a big point in the agenda in Latin America. So those discourses become very, very obvious. Uh, and the connection between um, the government and their discourses and the family and how it feels within the family, make it also becomes a little bit more visible. So yeah, I, I yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's so the intimacy in the boundaries of the family. That's something that I want to challenge. I think that's the the big point there. Can I because I I like that I agree with you that the the boundaries of the family should be challenged because uh, the, the private is public and, and, and the other way around. But so with intimacy, I tend to think about how, um, 
uh, how how certain beatings hurt more than others no so if you're very close to someone you a lot of um, a, a lot of women in abusive relationships say that actually the words the the uh, the, the the humiliation hurts more than the actual beatings no and why is that because because that is about it's about your your sense of self it's your subjectivity that is being harmed you know your confidence your your freedom your your freedom in a very in, not in an abstract way not in a structural way but in a very individual way can you go to and visit the neighbor neighbor freely yes or no no without being beaten so very on a very and that's what i mean by intimacy that is very intimate if somebody who says who loves you and who has sex with you then says but you cannot do this because i say so and otherwise i beat you then that seems to be of a different level than if an unknown person um i don't know if you get um violently robbed on the street that's a different experience because of the level of intimacy. That, so that's what I mean by intimacy. At the same time, I completely agree with you. And, and that's why I think it's so difficult sometimes to understand violence against women because of that intimacy, no? Mm -hmm. But I completely agree with you that the boundary between the, in, between the personal and the political is absolutely not that clear at all, absolutely. I, I wonder, so... Uh, uh, so there, there is so you you make a really really good question there like um how certain beatings he uh, hurt more than others and that's uh, we can talk about that in in the framework of embodied experience and how how this is perceived by the individual but i also wonder why um the 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 type of consider beating or something more like like the limiting of uh, rights within a society why that doesn't hurt as much so why so it, i mean yeah it's complicated because it's a different type of violence it's not a violence that is perpetuated over the body but it's perpetuated over the self so every time that uh, that rights uh, women's rights of children rights or uh, lgbtq um community rights are getting narrower it is completely uh, an infliction of violence upon those bodies however somehow that um uh, that type of violence hurt less to the individual and to the society and i um so there is an expression in very Spanish. i don't know how to say that in english but it's like ya están hecho callo. so 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 there is so much uh you have such a hard skin there is so so much uh, uh, damage done over the um, autonomy and the self and the idea of representation within society of certain groups that you 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 are not expecting anything from the state from the state so when when things are taken away like freedoms and rights and, and are taken away somehow that doesn't hurt and that for me is extremely problematic because if you are not feeling the hurt, you don't want to burn it all. You mm -hmm. don't feel like going out to the streets and doing something makes any sense. So that's also my uh, my problem with expressing the idea of intimacy and just consider intimacy as the fuel to think about why is this wrong? It's also oh, wrong when it. we are not feeling okay. something because there is a reason why, why we are not feeling. We are so uh, used to that certain type of violence that there is no triggering anything else. And that, that is problematic. I think in, in countries that have a, a colonial experience and, and that have experience of violence in the broader context of society, violence becomes something that it's not hurting anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and that numbness is a problem. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Will you also explain, uh, actually, in, in your explanation now, what, what comes out very nicely, I think, is the idea that sort of a, a, a lot of restrictions on rights um, actually does affect individual subjectivity, individual sense of self, no? Mm -hmm. And that that is so, and that could be 
defined as a, as an intimacy. That's not how I meant it previously, but you're right, of course. I think that that's uh, a good interpretation as well of the intimate uh, understanding of the self, of your own subjectivity. And if those rights are being constantly infringed by particular laws or with particular policies or, uh, or violences and structures, then that is a very intimate form of violence. Absolutely, yeah. I do wonder, I'm just going to jump in there quickly when we're talking about intimacy, because I, I also, is there a risk of conceptually collapsing these different forms of violence, like um, through the, the legal system and infringement on political rights, uh, mobility for, an, you know, the, the, the sexual based uh, violence that's done on the body? Like, it, I'm, I'm, I'm. This is not a fully formed thought, but I, I am a bit troubled by, because there is something very, I think, um, yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm not sure. I, I, I wonder what, what you feel you can get conceptually by lumping intimacy in that regard with the state intimacy with the actual, you know, the, the physical material violence, sexual violence that's done on someone's body. Um, oh that's that's an interesting thing i don't want to lump lump them together like the, the collapsing of the two the, the, the embodied experience all the way that have its own value and, and the understanding and normalization of certain things it has another type of explanation however what i and, and that's why it's so difficult to talk about violence and i find it extremely difficult it's, it's because they are intertwined they talk to each other like they they and, and you can see that that's also interesting in how narrative work, because um, when you talk to someone that has been uh, abused by their husband, there is also the connection with the state and the normalization of abuse when they are not going to talk to the police. Um, and, and, and that experience of, but why am, why am I going to go there if they are not going to do anything, if they are not going to believe me? Um, and then he, you, and that is also a connection with political discourse that in Ecuador we have a very, very conservative government at the moment that have talked a lot about um, women's roles in abuse. So how they provoke abuse for themselves in, in, in political discourse. So it also again becomes something that it's normalized that it's interiorized, that it, it becomes incredibly personal. Um, but again, I don't think this collapse. I think they are intertwined and they talk uh, very closely and they can be definitely seen in different stages of how women deal with violence because also women deal with violence in different times. So it's not the same in the moment you are receiving a, a, a kick, a blow with Mac, uh, or the moment that you process that as trauma or the moment you you take that outside of your bedroom and talk to a friend or the moment you want to, to go to the state and use any of the institutions of the state to, to mention this. Or when you think about this in relation to the public discourse of the government. So all these things have a different experience and definitely have a different a way of being analyzed and a different impact on women and their body. However, I see them as all intertwined and all uh, collapsing back in the horrible experience of a woman. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they collapse in the idea of they are awful and they, they make the experience, um, yeah, they, they go back to the idea of creating subordination and inferiority exactly. um, in women's, yeah. I, I agree with you, Andrea. I also think that they're very much interlinked and, and that, that the use, or I find it useful to link them explicitly because they link in their uh, very often in their in their ideological goal and increasingly in contemporary latin america and other parts of the world this actually is becoming a, a political idea and a political movement no where patriarchy and patriarchal violence is is very much linked to a particular politics um, um uh, that that basically uh, is is very explicitly pro inequality 
and that violence is a legitimate means to enforce that inequality. See Brazil and other um, uh, particular uh, right-wing governments and movements uh, in, in, uh, in Latin America particularly, no? So because of that link and because of that explicit um, uh, sort of legitimizing certain forms of violence in order to uh, dominate over certain groups, uh, that, that is the use of seeing them in the same picture, but for different goals, if you look at it from a judicial perspective, you have, to, you know, then there's a whole range of different interpretations of different forms of violence, uh, and likewise in terms of institutional violence and so on, um, but linked, yes. Well, I want to say again, thank you so much. It, uh, it feels wonderful to have another of these conversations. And we haven't had this type of conversations in a long, long time because of COVID and because, yeah, it, it, it feels amazing. Thank you for the time. And Drew, do you have a paper on this as well too? I'm sorry? Do you have a paper? Is there an actual paper on this or was this a presentation without a paper? Uh, this was a presentation without a paper and that's why I really, um, that's the reason I say yes to do the new voices because it yeah. really forced me to put pen to paper. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and the idea was, okay, let's bring this out of my uh, PhD thesis and transform it in something that I can publish. So this, this is my first, my first step towards the proper blown up paper. <laughs> Can I, uh, uh, Luis wrote a question in the Q&A section of this Zoom meeting. So I thought it might be, it's actually, oh. it's a good point, Luis. So you're asking the term productive is, is, has a positive connotation. Is that not a risk in how you label violence, the positive yeah. overtone? So I'm curious what you think, Andrea. Oh, I, I really love that question. Uh, because it, it means to be, it, so I have had this conversation about pro productive violence is a topic that I have discussed with Yelke previously and that I have discussed with my feminist research group a lot. And I have to defend the use of productive uh, quite a lot because it, it is provocative. It, it, productivity is something that is very much considered in positive terms. However, one of the points that it needs to be clear is that I think also productivity is should not be considered always positive. Because if we are thinking in broader terms, they explode, every type of exploitation is productive. And we can see now in climate change and everything, right? Everything uh, we are considering productive is effective, but the bottom line of what are we producing and uh, who is benefiting this is definitely um, worth asking. And that the idea of productivity allows us to see, to be critical to a system, to be, and also to pinpoint where who is gaining within the system. But it's it's definitely something that I need to 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 make clear. So the idea of productivity needs to be challenged, not always as positive and almost always as extractive. You know, I didn't even question that because I guess I must be so versed in Foucault that I just assumed that's what you're talking about, Foucaultian kind of yeah. the politics, politics, right? The yeah. politics. What what politics is this doing as opposed mm -hmm. to um yeah, as a positive connotation. So yeah, that's a good question for me to reflect too. Um, I guess then that that matters the disciplinary background that you're coming from too, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do wonder too in that terms, and this might just be a concept, like have you also thought about, uh, you know, um, feminist work of using reproductive as well? Like what what is this reproducing as opposed to productive or, or was that? something you thought about or, or think that that's a ridiculous idea. I haven't thought about that. Okay. So no, I, I was very much focused on the idea of, of productivity and uh, yeah, yeah, I, I was not thinking about the reproduction at all or reproduction as, as productive to as productive to the productive system. So the, yeah. the repetition of uh, behaviors and social norms and the creation of a pattern, it means to be productive, but yeah. I, I think it's a fabulous question, Amanda. I haven't thought about it either, but I think it's a fabulous question, and particularly if you think as 
um, a, a lot of domestic violence is seen or has its roots in, which is not the same, of course, but it definitely has its roots in kind of disciplinary regimes that are seen as completely legitimate and that we, that we see or saw or still see in schools as well as in homes, that is actually part of reproductive labor, you know? And a lot of women, we don't really talk about this too much perhaps, but there's a, a lot of mothers beat their children as part of this disciplining regime, as part of their reproductive caring work. And that, that if we want it or not, that does feed in to practices of, uh, of, of uh, domestic violence as a sort of, as a normalization of, of using violence as a form of disciplining and communication. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great question, Amanda, and something to, to think about a little bit further. Violence as reproductive as, as well as productive. Yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting, too. Just Elka, hearing you say that is that it also I mean, I wonder if it has potential to challenge how we think about care work, too. Right. Um, th that happens if this is part of you know, in feminist political economy ways, reproducing the next workforce or labor force that's invariably gendered as well, too. Is this some of, you know, violence that goes into the care work, which seems counterintuitive as well, right? That care is supposed to be nurturing. Well, so so is the family. We imagine it to be a caring space as well. And that that could help you, Drea, think about, think about, um, what intimacy or the act of intimate violence looks like in these different spaces, right? When we link it to, yeah, when we link it to feminist political economy of reproducing new um, workforces with, with the idea of care and that goes along with that as well too. Sorry, I mean, you might not choose to do that at all, but I think that's, that, that would be an interesting um, line of inquiry as well. No, it's great. And also you, you just mentioned something that I found very valuable, the idea of how we, we imagine, so that how we imagine family, we imagine things working, how we, and that's, uh, that's something that we share uh, in different societies, the, the family as nurturing, but also within the family, this idea of um, producing and reproducing normative forms of obedience are there. Like it's, it's almost like what you are imagining and the way it's happening. And, um, that it's interesting to explore, yes. Yeah, great, I can't wait to see this like materialize into a fantastic paper. So you'll have to come back and update us on your brilliant work. <laughs> sure, fingers crossed.